Good morning, Strasburg United Methodist Church. Today is March 19th, 2023. We are continuing in our series about developing habits for the spiritual life. Will you pray with me now as we begin our worship service? Source of light, God of great mercy and love, we come to you this day seeking restoration of our sight. Clear away our blindness and give us a new vision of all that we can accomplish in your name. Give us strength and confidence to truly witness to your abiding love and faithfulness. For we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We prepared some music for you today for your worship. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit to this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Will you join me now in a time of prayers of the people? Dear God, we depend on you for everything we need, for daily food, for guidance and protection, for healing and injury and comfort and sorrow. You respond in abundant provision. Thank you for your tender care of us. Thank you for soothing the wounds of this life. Thank you that in the presence of enemies, especially the last enemy of death, you are with us. Knowing your faithfulness in our lives, we bring before you the lives of others, the cares of this world, entrusting all things to your goodness and mercy. Bring healing to those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit. Bring release to those who are held captive by old hurts or new bonds that oppress and entangle. Bring freedom to those unjustly accused, relief to those burdened with debt, comfort to all who suffer from abuse of any kind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for people living precariously in the midst of war. Protect, we pray, citizens and soldiers alike, and teach us to put away our weapons, taking up instead words of peace and reconciliation. By the power at work in Christ, break down the walls of hostility we build so that we may learn to live together graciously. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We remember those living in the midst of drought and famine. We pray for rain to fall and crops to grow and for generosity to overflow from our own hands and resources until all your children receive their daily bread, until all your children have clean water to drink, until all your children have adequate shelter and medical care. Compel us to be better stewards of creation so that our habitation is sustainable and responsible. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, help us to see the world as you see it, to see others as you see them, and to see ourselves rightly because you have come into this world for judgment, we can leave our own judgments behind. Pursue us all with your goodness and faithful love until goodness and faithful love fills every heart and informs every nation. We pray these things in the name of the one who came that we might see, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Will you now pray with me this prayer that Jesus taught us as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you join me now in our prayer for illumination? Gracious God, illumine our hearts and minds as the scriptures are read and proclaimed, so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may see what is good and right and true. And seeing, help us to do what is pleasing to you, so that your glory becomes visible in our words and deeds. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The first scripture I'm going to share with you comes from Psalm chapter 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world, and those who live in it. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me the two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping what you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take that talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We've been talking about the habits of the spiritual life in the last few weeks. I've spoken about the importance of worship, the adoption of spiritual practices such as prayer, fasting, and scripture reading. And last week I spoke about how we are servants and take on the mantle of servant leadership in our relationships with others. Now this week I'm going to talk about stewardship. And this means that I will talk about money and possessions and what it means to be wealthy in God's way. There was an old preacher named Ben Rogers uh, down from Roanoke, Virginia, who once penned these words as a warning to both pastors and congregations. He writes, when you go to a doctor for your annual checkup, he or she will often begin to poke and prod and press various places, all the while asking, does this hurt? How about this? And if you cry out in pain, one of two things has happened. Either the doctor has pushed too hard without the right sensitivity, or more likely there's something wrong with you. And the doctor will say, we'd better do some more tests. It's not supposed to hurt there. So it is when pastors preach on financial responsibility and certain members will cry out in discomfort, criticizing the message and the messenger. Either the pastor has pushed too hard, or perhaps there's something wrong. In that case, Ben Rogers says, my friend, we're in need of the great physician because it's not supposed to hurt there. So to begin my sermon, I'm gonna share a story from Greek mythology. There once was a king named Midas, and one day Midas was generous to one of the Greek gods. 
In return for his generosity, Midas was granted one wish, and Midas wished to be able to turn things into gold with his touch. Now, as the story continues, we discover that Midas was unable to eat or drink because everything he touched turned to gold. When he wanted the garden, his favorite plants turned into useless lumps of metal. And when he went to embrace his daughter, she too turned to solid gold. Midas begged the God who gave him this gift to reverse this dreadful curse, for that is what the Midas touch had become. The myth concludes that Midas washed in a river and the sands beneath turned to gold and washed all the greed out of Midas. And he was transformed into a lover of the arts. And the myth tells about his lifelong pursuit of making beautiful music. Now, a few years ago, I was touched by gold fever. My wife and I were living in Georgia at the time, and we traveled to Dahlonega, Georgia, a sleepy little town in the North Georgia mountains. We visited the Consolidated Gold Mine, which is an actual working mine that sifts tons of sand in search for gold flakes. For $20, Visitors like us could have the opportunity to pan for gold at large troughs of river sand. After 20 minutes of learning the finer points of panning, we were left with a few flakes of pure gold. And at the end of the day, you could take home a little vial filled with those gold flakes. Of course, with far less value than the $20 you spent. Now, we also visited the Gold Museum while we were there, and we watched a movie that told the sordid history of this now sleepy town. In 1802, shortly after the discovery of gold in the river, thousands of Cherokee Indians were forced to march in the winter from Georgia to Oklahoma, and most of those people died in what we now call the Trail of Tears. Greed caused the removal of an entire nation. Greed caused the deaths of thousands. Greed clouded people's minds. Part of that movie focused on interviews with old-timers who had heard their grandparents' stories growing up. And it was interesting to see that all of those stories were about the riches that could have been and all the what-ifs that go with that. If the mine had not collapsed, if the Civil War had not intervened, if we had only worked on the river one more day. But very little was said about those who were forced to leave. Now, we were able to walk away and return home. We didn't get caught up in the greed that had captured so many others. But that experience that day made me think, you know, there has to be something beyond the riches of this world. There must be something that can focus our minds and guide our hearts and strengthen our faith. Now, did you know that Jesus speaks about money and possessions more than any other topic in the New Testament? I'm going to give you a few of those scriptures to think about. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus says in response to a greedy brother who wants a greater share of the inheritance, Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist on the abundance of possessions. This is followed by a parable about a man who builds bigger barns to hold his crops, only to have God say to him, Tonight, I demand your life from you. Later in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 12, Jesus tells the same crowd, Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus says you cannot serve God and wealth. Now, later in the New Testament, money and possessions is also spoken about often. Four full chapters of the book of Acts are devoted to teachings about possessions and how we manage them. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, we hear this phrase, The love of money is the root of all evil. And I think all of us know that story about the man who had two sons. One day, the, the younger son tells his father that he wants his share of the inheritance. And after his father gave him the money, the son left 
squandering all of it. And he finally returns home, begging for forgiveness. His father, who had been waiting for him every day, runs out to meet him, welcomes him back into the family, and throws him a party. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if one of my two sons wished I were dead, took half of my money, wasted it, and then came back begging, I'm not so sure that I would welcome him in the same way that that prodigal father did. But all of these scriptures and others like them give us the parameters of living the Christian life in relation to money and wealth and possessions. And I want to challenge you that, that creating wealth in God's way means to know what wealth is. We know what it means to the, in the view of this world. Wealth is the sum total of our possessions. It's the money that we can count that's in our bank accounts and IRAs. It's the equity in our house. It's the cars we drive. It's the stuff that we can touch and taste and revel in. But do you know that material possessions have a way of trapping us? The more stuff we have, the more time we spend taking care of that stuff. Now, for those of you who live in apartments, just imagine how much cleaning you would have to do if you lived in a four-bedroom house. And for those of you who live in a, a two-bedroom house, imagine how much cleaning you would have to do if you lived in a mansion. Money and possessions are not really ours. And that's where I'm going to give you another piece of scripture. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Now, it's a, a simple statement, isn't it? It's the first line of Psalm 24, written by David. And you guys know David. David was the boy who felled a giant with a slingshot. The man who created beautiful songs and sung them in front of Saul, which we know as many of our psalms. The man who became a great king. A man who danced in the streets when the Ark of the Covenant was returned to Jerusalem. A man who had everything. And he was the one to write these words. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Now these are also the words spoken by Moses to the Pharaoh when the plague of hail fell upon the land of Egypt when Moses was trying to free his people. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. These are the words spoken by God to Moses in Deuteronomy, just before God tells Moses that the descendants of Abraham are both chosen and loved. It's also right at the point where the Ten Commandments are revealed for a second time to God's people. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. These are the words spoken by Paul to the Corinthians, telling them that God has created a new covenant through Jesus and that the ancient food laws no longer apply and they should be free to eat everything. Now for us, they are a statement of faith, an acknowledgement that God is our God, our ruler and our Lord and our Savior. And these words should describe what we believe about our possessions and even about these bodies that we live in. You see, we own nothing. Nothing is ours. Ownership presumes permanence. And there is nothing permanent in this world. That shirt you're wearing, well, it's only with you for a short time. Eventually, it will wear out, and it will be discarded, and eventually it will return to its elements. That home you live in, even when you pay it off, it will truly never be yours. Eventually, you will move on to another place, and maybe another place, until you die. I was watching an interview with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, that American astrophysicist. He had a glass of water on the table in front of him, and he said that every cup that passes through a single person and eventually rejoins the world's water holds enough molecules to mix 1,500 of them into every other cup of water in the world. No way around it. Some of the water you just drank passed through the kidneys of Socrates and Genghis Khan and Joan of Arc. Even these bodies of ours are just borrowing elements from the world around us. And when we die, we return to the earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. 
And what I would argue is that we hold all things in trust for God. We are stewards of this earth. We are stewards of money and possessions. And we are even stewards of our bodies. And that raises another question for me. Are we trustworthy? Do we embezzle from God when we act selfishly and with greed? Are we stealing from our creator when we waste our money and our time and ourselves on foolish pursuits? In the parable of the talents, the master gives different amounts of money to different servants. When the master returns to collect, he discovers that one has hidden his money in a hole. Nothing was risked, but also nothing was gained either. Jesus ends that parable by saying, to whom much is given, much is expected. Now, I'm not going to argue that it's wrong to be a person of means, because it isn't. And it's not wrong to have material possessions or lots of money. But if that's the only goal in your life, then you are as misguided as King Midas was when he wished for the ability to turn everything to gold with a single touch of his hand. You see, the goal of life is not about having wealth. It's about what we do with it. And creating wealth God's way means being a good steward of all that God gives us and that all that God gives us temporary control and power over. When I think back to the parable of the prodigal son, I am reminded that one point of that story is about generosity. You see, the father is not concerned with money or possessions. Money is nothing compared to the retrieval of a relationship to someone he cares for. Being wealthy in God's way means that we are wealthy in our relationships. And I want you to think right now of as many friends that you can. Just start naming them off in your head. See their faces in your mind and thank God for their presence in your life. Now I want you to think of as many family members that you can. Think of their names and see their faces in your mind. Thank God for the presence in your life. And I want you to think right now of as many coworkers and neighbors and other people that you know. Think of their names, see their faces in your mind, and thank God for their presence in your life. Let me tell you, you are wealthy, for you are loved, not just by God, but by friends, family, co-workers, the people who may even sit next to you at church. You are loved, and you have been given the gift of God's love and salvation. Being wealthy, in God's vision of it, means also being generous. In his sermon on money, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, encouraged his early followers to first, earn all you can, second, save all you can, and third, give away all that you can. He emphasized the give all you can above all else. When you see portraits of John Wesley, you might notice that he had very long hair. Well, he had long hair because he saw it as a waste to get his hair cut. Throughout his life, he lived on the sum of 28 British pounds per year. If he made 40 pounds one year, the extra 12 went to support the poor. And he famously said that if he died with more than 10 pounds to his name, that he should be cursed as a hypocrite. Early Methodists dressed plainly. They believed that clothes were just practical things. Women were encouraged not to wear jewelry and men were encouraged to spend their free time in service to the poor rather than at games of chance. Methodists were expected to give, not just to the church and to the administrative functions of it, but to support the lifting up of those who were poor in their community. John Wesley believed that by transferring material goods from those who had abundance to those who were in need, allowed more people to be open to the power of God and to understand God's grace. For John Wesley, our job as Christians is to prepare the way for God in this world. And one way to do that was to help people out of trouble. And I think it's the same thing that Jesus desires for all of us. We do not pursue things 
We do not argue over stuff. In the end, our lives will be judged by how well we treated others. If we are selfish, if we are greedy, if we pursue one thing and harm others in the process, then we are not living Christian lives at all. Even though our mouths praise God, our actions prove that we are hypocrites and that we truly are lost. The Navajo people of the American Southwest believe that how they fill their minds will shape their lives. This traditional thinking leads them to fill their minds with what is good, inspiring, and edifying. They speak of thinking the beauty way, ridding their minds of all that is destructive and filling them with that which is good and peaceful. The beauty way is the way of love and commitment, peace and kindness, patience and courage. And that leads to my final point about being wealthy in God's way. Being wealthy requires a transformation. We move from possessiveness to stewardship. We move from a sense of me to all. We look at the community outside of the four walls of the church and we ask God to use us to solve problems. And we pursue God rather than things. Now, in the last few weeks, we've defined a habit as something that comes naturally in response to a trigger. It's an unconscious reaction that reveals a deeper pattern of thought. And if we are to be stewards and to be wealthy in the way that God wishes for us to be wealthy, then we need to create new patterns in our lives for how to respond to the need that we see around us. Being wealthy in the ways of God means that we pay attention to how God wants us to live. For a brief moment, on our way home from vacation in the North Georgia mountains, I daydreamed about living with my wife in a cabin in Dahlonega, Georgia, panning for gold every day, searching for that undiscovered nugget that would make us rich. But then I thought, that's not who I am. That's not who I'm called to be. Even though I can imagine a lifetime in pursuit of those shiny things, I knew that I would never be happy with how my life turned out. And I challenge you to be wealthy in the way that God wishes you to be wealthy. I challenge you to remember the words of David, of Moses, of Paul, that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. When we can move from a place of ownership to a place of stewardship, our generosity will expand. Love God, love your neighbor, and give generously of all that you currently possess, your time, your talents, and even the days of life that you have been graciously given by God. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give and give you peace forever. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever. The Lord bless you and keep the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you